What's up? This is Jason, and you're listening to the Kingdom Core Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Kingdom Core Podcast. This was such a fun, special episode. We chatted with Jason Wisdom, uh, currently of Death Therapy, X Becoming the Archetype, and some other projects. This is probably the most hilarious episode we've done yet, and really can't wait for you guys to watch and or listen to it. Uh, we talked to Jason about the band's recent new release album, Melancholy Machines, and the switch from Solid State over to Tooth and Nail. We kind of get into his history of coming up in the scene uh, with his old band Becoming the Archetype, and we also talk about kind of what makes a Christian band, why or why not use the label Christian for this band or that band. It's a really good, interesting conversation. We hope you guys get a lot out of it. We had some technical difficulties throughout. You'll probably hear I left some segments in because it's literally just the funniest thing to me anyways, listening back. We're, we're laughing throughout the whole thing. Um, so pardon those, <laughs> those little hiccups, but uh, hopefully you guys get some laughs out of that. Just before we hop in, Whatever platform you guys are listening on, it would be awesome if you would hit that like button, uh, share, rate, leave us a five-star review on iTunes if you're, most of our listeners are on Apple, because that, that really helps people discover the podcast. But hey, if you guys want to leave something less, you know, we've actually really enjoyed reading those reviews. There's been a lot of funny ones. Also, if you want the episodes 24 hours early and part of our exclusive Facebook group, you guys can head over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash Kingdom Core Podcast. And uh, our links will be in the show notes and or the description of the video. Yes, there is a video version and you might want to watch this one. Um, it would be so awesome to have you guys over on our Patreon. Uh, we, it's a great way to support the podcast, help us keep getting better at what we're doing and uh yeah every every dollar that you guys donate will go towards making this podcast better in some way but yeah with all that being said thank you for being here let's hop into this episode so jason thank you so much for being with us today how you doing man i'm doing awesome doing how about awesome. you yeah doing all right yeah uh rough game for the braves last night we're just gonna go right in with that huh yeah, we're gonna go right in with that. <laughs> I'm just gonna. I guess folk. I guess folks on the West Coast are a little salty, so they have to bring up the Braves getting. Hey, no, 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 no. I am. A, I am an Angels fan. I am on your side. I hate the Astros. Uh, okay, good. Good to hear. We're not gonna talk about the Braves until the victory is sealed. I was, not. dude, I was rooting last night. I was watching the game. I'm like, please win so we can talk about this tomorrow night. I wanted yeah, to I'm, so badly. It's been 20 something years. I just, I think every Braves fan right now is preparing their mind to be like, well, you know, it was a good season and I'm glad we made it to the World Series. Like everyone's like lowering their expectations. Just anyway. Yeah. As a Vancouver it's, it's Canucks a, fan, I know the feeling. Hmm. It has been awful. Wow. For many, many years. Well, yeah, we all just have the, terrible the problem, sports teams. <laughs> the problem, the problem with Atlanta team, with teams from the state of Georgia, is that they're not awful. They're just not quite good enough to make it all the way. So, mm -hmm. anyway, the Georgia Bulldogs are number one in NCAA football right now. Uh, that's that's cool. surely going to end soon. Who is uh? Do you have like a do you have like a medieval knife that lives with you, or is that silverware clanking around? <laughs> My wife's cooking dinner, putting away dishes. And... I couldn't tell. Uh, that sounded like there was like ask that. jousting oh or gosh. something in the background. Uh, Chris can Chris can edit that out. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna mute him. Hmm. I'll leave awesome. all that first audio in there so that we can leave that. Part. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, that's great. So, um, in all seriousness, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're excited to have you on. Um, you're beloved yeah. in the Christian metal scene. You're, uh, you're kind of thought of. I think you are. I don't know. 
<laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> people always uh, people always laugh react your comments on in Facebook groups. So I assume mm, so. <laughs> that's the ju- that's the way we judge success. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lots of people laugh at this Christian guy. Hardcore group. Yeah, I'm I'm waiting for the like Christian heavy metal comedy tour, and then I'll be I'll finally be where I need to be in the scene. There That'd you go. Sick. Is that going to be your next project? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Death Therapy. You guys uh, just dropped a, um, n- or not just, it was actually quite a bit ago. Back in May, you dropped your third uh, full length Melancholy yep. Machines on Tooth and Nail Records, correct? Correct. Switched correct. from Solid Sweet. State Solid State over to Tooth and Nail for that one. Perfect. I was just going to ask about that. What, how, how did the switch go about? Was that your decision? Was that the label? Uh, yeah. Just talk us through that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, basically they are, you know, they're all connected tooth and nail, solid state, one label, really um, just two different sides of the same coin. Everything I've done over the past 20 years has been with solid state, but I turned in this album and they were kind of like, well, this is a little bit more of like an alternative rock record. Maybe we should put it out on the alternative rock record label that we have rather than the metalcore label that we have. Because for the first two albums, Death Therapy sort of tried to fit in with the Solid State thing. And uh, it just didn't really stick. I'm not saying there weren't some people who grabbed onto it. But uh, but yeah, so it's so far so good with the tooth and nail thing. What what kind of made you go that direction, like a slightly softer side of the band? Uh, that is the million dollar question. But I think it's mainly just the fact that I'm just really old and tired now. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, so I just want some music that's a little more chill no no honestly um with death therapy i've always treated it sort of as more of an experiment and um it's been a lot of fun to just kind of do whatever so at the beginning of the covid pandemic i released an ep of like video game instrumental music Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was that was totally different but it was just like well i want to do this so with the new record the melancholy machines record it was like well maybe i can challenge myself to do some more clean vocals some more like like rock sounding bass rather than if somebody goes and listens to the first two records, they'll notice that it kind of sounds like a guitar. Like I almost, I almost trick you a little bit with the uh, effect that's on the bass. It's, it isn't a guitar by the way. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, but it's also, it's got like an octave effect. So like it, it Mm. sounds kind of like a guitar and we put it through a guitar amp on the first two records. But on the new record, we were just like, why don't we just make it sound like a really big bass and see if it turns out cool. So all those things kind of went together and Melancholy Machines came out of it. So yeah, it was it was definitely a different uh, record. It kind of caught me off guard because Tension was the first single you dropped, right? Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that decision, but... Uh, <laughs> if anyone from the record label is listening to this, uh, they, it was the best decision. <laughs> but I uh, I maintain to this day that like part of my problem as a artist is that I just I do stuff that about like twenty percent of people think is cool and the other eighty percent think is weird, <laughs> and they they decided to put out the weirdest song from the record first, and I was like, well, okay. So I was fully expecting the whole album to sound like that after I'm like, yeah, this same is death therapy. <laughs> Well, that is one mistake that you can't make. With I, I saw somebody the other day. I can't remember who it was on Twitter, and he said something. He tweeted, um, "If you if you recognize this tweet, let's not say who it was, but because um, when I said I don't remember, I'm lying. I know who it was. I just can't tell you." Um, <laughs> they said, "I really love when a band puts out a record where every song sounds the same." I'm not joking. That's what they said, and they weren't being sarcastic. And. Um, a bunch of people were like, dude, those, I don't know. And then other people were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I love an insert band that I'm not going to mention either because I don't want those bands to hate me. But um, <laughs> here's, here's, my, here's, my, here's my point. Here's my point. I don't do music like that. I don't like music like that. I like an album to take me on sort of a sonic journey 
that mm-hmm. goes all over the place. So, yep, my next record is going to be like safari noises and uh, <laughs> hip hop, hip hop break beats. Yeah, like so- I think as different as the songs were on this album, like it's very eclectic in a way, but it mm-hmm. has like a proper band, like a proper album should. It still sounds like you like throughout maybe with like a little spice here and there but at least it sounds i think it sounds cohesive which oh yeah a hundred percent you were going for a full sound you didn't really stray from it throughout the whole thing and i really like that because when i listened to the first time and i got to the final track and it ended i did feel like oh great like i was taken on another another uh another one of jason wisdom stories which was great i love it awesome well that's the pitch for the album. If anybody hasn't checked it out, hopefully uh, they'll do it because of that. It's a journey. It goes from sort of like grungy, heavy rock at the beginning to sort of like melancholy, indie, dark, but hopeful at the end. And mm-hmm. there's all kinds mm-hmm. of weird stuff in between, including saxophones, solos. and <laughs> I love it. Everything there is else. nothing better than unexpected saxophone in music, especially like in the rock in the metal genre. I just absolutely adore it when they take a creative chance and they throw in a saxophone. <laughs> yeah, that's my new punk band, Unexpected Saxophone. <laughs> that's, that's a great name. Yeah. <laughs> who who did the saxophone for you? Uh, a guy named Chris Bowman, who's a friend and a producer in uh, Atlanta. He does a lot of cool stuff. So. That's cool. He's a great. And so, he, uh, he's a great sax player. As a matter of fact, that's great. as a matter of fact, he uh, he was super confused because if someone goes and listens to that, say we're spending all of our time talking about that song that I wish we could all forget. Um, but <laughs> if, if someone goes and listens to the song "Tension," which is on the record, um, the saxophone uh, there's some parts that are really really awesome. Uh, I mean, it's all awesome, but there's some parts that sound really like musically like cohesive. There's other parts that are intentionally like cacophonous and like chaotic sounding on the saxophone. And when the producer, Nate Washburn, uh, who I've been working with, brought him in, he told him to play all these like, he's like, play bad on purpose. <laughs> and, and Chris was like, I don't, I don't, this is not why I got a degree in saxophone so that you could bring me in and tell me to play badly. <laughs> but I think it turned out really cool. So, yeah. That's sweet. And so circling back to, um, so you had that store, that instrumental like game, uh, video game style EP. And then you had yep. this record. This was originally supposed to be an EP, right? If I, if my memory uh, serves me correct. Yeah. When I thought that COVID, the COVID, uh, lockdowns and situation was going to last for about a week or two, I planned on knocking out a couple EPs and, um, <laughs> As the as it became more like a two year thing, um, I had more songs, I had more ideas. Um, I, you know, the the Start EP another that band. I, yeah, the, the EP <laughs> that I did in the EP that I did in two, 2020 was actually self released. The first thing I've done self released. Um, okay, so it didn't come out through Solid State, and then I sort of approached the record label. Um, crawling on my knees, begging for them to take me back. And <laughs> that's when they said, they said, no, I'll get out of here. Go to tooth and nail. And that's <laughs> not the real story, but anyway. Yeah. So um, what sort of, uh, what sort of lyrical themes or inspiration did you have for melancholy machines? Take us through like, what's the story behind it? Sad hmm. robots. Yeah. Sad robots, melancholy machines. Um, <laughs> You know, I've kind of always, uh, I've kind of approached death therapy the opposite of the way that I approached music for the first 15 years of my career, which is in the past with Becoming the Archetype, which is my former band, I wrote more thematic, like story driven or like end of the world apocalyptic angels and demons battling sorts of lyrics. They were very like meticulously thought out and spent lots of time digging through the thesaurus, the thesaurus right? <laughs> um, to come up with the, the coolest sounding stuff and make people think I was really smart. And with death therapy, 
I basically said, let's not do that at all. I just want to write the music and I'm not going to overthink the music. And then I'm going to just see what lyrics happen. Uh, what kind of comes out of my brain, uh, stream of consciousness style. Um, so the, the themes for death therapy almost across the board have been very like personal struggles and anxieties and depressions and, um, a lot of it in a way that doesn't necessarily get resolved, but that's part of why the journey is important. I think if people listen all the way from the, like the beginning to the end, uh, it sort of resolves itself in the end, but some of the songs are just very dark. Um, and some of the songs also, this is the case on the last couple of death therapy records too. Some of the lyrics are like, what's the term I'm looking for? Like, like split personality. That's what I was looking for. Split personality is what I mean. Like I'll be talking, one voice is telling me everything is terrible. And then sort of like another voice is telling me there's hope. Mm. And uh, that's something that I've just, I, I haven't even set out to do that on purpose, but yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. So with melancholy machines, what does that phrase specifically mean? Nothing, man. It just sounds awesome. <laughs> Is that no, also, I, Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I mean it, it, uh, I, I, first of all, it sounds awesome. Second of all, it, um, I think that there is a there is an underlying reality that a lot of Christians, especially in like very top level famous like mega church Christians, like health and wealth type Christianity, um, doesn't seem to understand, which is that life is tragic and life is hard, and Jesus was mm-hmm. a man of sorrows, and mm-hmm. it like. There's like we are so in that way, it's sort of like we are designed or we are programmed uh, by sin and by a fallen world and by our nature and perhaps what God intended for our soul building um, here on this planet during this time. You know, all those sorts of things. Um, I don't think it's wrong for us as Christians to embrace the fact that like it's not all rainbows and unicorn farts. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely cool. Um, Because I I definitely agree. You see that a lot where just sometimes there's people who just don't get it that life is hard. Mm -hmm. Life can be sad and and there's just so much that we go through. But like, obviously, we have Jesus to kind of keep our eyes on and guide us through life. So it's a, I think it's a maturity thing. I mean, everything in life, there's whether, like, even if we're not talking about spiritual stuff, I mean, I think Mm -hmm. we find, we find out that as, like, when we're really young, everything's super, like, cut and dry and black and white. Everything's really easy to understand, right? Um, you don't touch Mm -hmm. the stove because it's hot. You don't do this. You don't do that. Like, or you do this. But as you get older and more mature, you start to realize, like, sometimes two things are true at the same time that are really hard to reconcile with one another. But, holding the two of them in tension is actually what makes you a mature person. And, Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people, it's really, it's really disheartening, but at the same time, most of the people who walk away from the Christian faith or develop sort of like big personalities and become famous as Christians do so when they're like in their twenties. So like how mature are you in your twenties? Um, I mean, some people, I guess, might be pretty mature, but like, let's just say that at not me. <laughs> four, I just, I just said, like, let's just say that at at fourteen, you started taking your Christian faith seriously. Maybe even if you grew up in church your whole life. I mean, how mature are you going to be after like five or six years of you know what I'm saying? What I'm trying to get at is like, right? A lot of people, a lot of people, I think, never learn to hold these things in tension. The fact that life is tragic, life is. Str- like a struggle and there's suffering and we die and a lot of things suck and we have hope and Christ understands and he has suffered too and which is which is which uh to tie that in with the record is why I decided to cover a song on the record called The Silence mm-hmm. of God which literally is the song that has meant more to me um in my spiritual journey just because it's a song that it doesn't say everything's going to be okay it doesn't like sugarcoat anything it just basically says you know, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and 
all of his friends were asleep and abandoned him basically. And then he died and was abandoned Mm -hmm. and he gets it. He gets it. And we have lost Christopher, but it's okay. Oh, what? No, he's still here. We've, we've lost you on my end. (laughs) Like your video. I still got both of you. (laughs) Um, Dang! Yeah, it well, says for, I, it says for I, me. Jason Wisdom's video has been disabled due to internet quality issues. Their video is still recorded, though. It's on still my, like on it. mine, it says Christopher Adams' video has been disabled due to internet quality yeah. issues. Their video is still recorded. <laughs> so we just have a bad connection somehow, but it's all good. We'll, we'll, uh, my connection is awesome. Thank you very much. I have like almost gigabit internet. <laughs> I don't know why it's so bad right now. Because you're in Canada. But, yeah. <laughs> Just that extra distance it has to go. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, actually, I was curious. I hey, you're back. I album again today. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, listening to the album again today, I really picked up on, like, In the Silence of God. Like, it's just, it, it was a cover song, right? Totally. It's a, originally written by a singer-songwriter named Andrew Peterson. Who oh! Was really cool. I have heard that guy. Uh, I know that I've name. I've talked about him. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, he's great. I don't think I've he's listened also, to the original, though. He's also a super, super good author, and I highly recommend his Wing Feather Saga books to anyone. If you like sort of like Narnia, Lord of the Rings, yeah. uh, with a little bit of humor. I literally, it's funny now that you say that name, I'm like, oh, I know, like, I just left my job at our local Christian bookstore, <laughs> and we've had those books come through, and I've seen his name multiple times, and I just, I've always wanted to read them, but. They have Christian bookstores in uh, Canada? Yeah, we have. <laughs> they we have, have Christianity in Canada. <laughs> that, I don't believe it for a second. I, don't I uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure all that was I banned. Can- in the eighties <laughs> to my knowledge, there's three left in British Columbia and two of them are owned by the guy that I worked for. Like I was working at one of the two on the Island here. And then there's awesome. one kind of outside of Vancouver. But as far as I know, that's about it. They're, they're you know, pretty, I, uh, uh, few and far between people ask me sometimes when we're on tour or, in podcast interviews, which so you may not you may not be prepared to ask me this question, so I'm going to ask it to myself, which is <laughs> Go ahead. What, which is of all the places you've been in the world, what is the most beautiful place you've ever been, and, or coolest place you've ever been? And I give I always give the same answer, which is when in 2008 we spent seven weeks um, in Gibson's, BC, off the coast of nice. Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, recording with Devin Townsend, and it was the most epically beautiful place. Like, perfect temperature the whole time, and mountains in the background, and the ocean on the other side. It was just like, this is paradise. And it was, other than the fact that it was very expensive to eat, and <laughs> yeah. like, we ate a lot, we ate a lot of, we ate a lot of craft dinner and, uh, and pierogies, frozen pierogies. Nice. That's the way to go. I I've never actually been to Gibson's, but it's literally if I had my window open here, I could almost see it from where I am. I'm across the across the way on Vancouver Island and hmm. it's basically just directly across the ocean there. It's the most beautiful place I've ever been to and you you could just you just don't care. <laughs> it's outside your window and you won't go. You just won't even go. <laughs> Well, it costs a lot of money to go there, man. <laughs> you know how expensive it is to live here? Actually, it's not as expensive as where Sean lives, but... Fair. <laughs> That's true. It's uh, for, for Canada. It's he lives in southern Canada. That's various. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome, though. I've, I've heard of a few, uh, like, tooth and nail artists that have kind of gone up. I guess maybe to that same studio or, or is, did you record there? Yes. Or are you just hanging out? I I recorded there for, for seven weeks with Devin Townsend. Uh, And that, that was for dichotomy. Yes. Okay. 
Canadian I, I, musical that, treasure. Actually, speaking of dichotomy, just just while we're on this topic for a second, my old one of my old youth pastors from 2008, uh-huh. maybe it was in 2009 that we were um, at this particular time. He was the biggest diehard becoming the archetype fan, and. Did he die? He showed me at youth group. He showed me a couple songs off of Dichotomy. <laughs> and I, absolutely, I have water in my mouth and I almost just spit it out over my computer. <laughs> so yeah, he, uh, he showed me I, I don't a couple think, songs. I don't think Chris heard what I said, so I think we're good. No, sorry. What, what did you say? Oh, you're talking about you're, him. You're talking about how he was the biggest fan. He it was the big. I was like, did he die? Oh. <laughs> No, honestly, I haven't talked to him in so many years since then. But um, that's uh, what happens to becoming the archetype fans. They disappear <laughs> and no one no one ever sees them again. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Um, but yeah, like he showed me a couple songs and this was before I was into metal. I absolutely like I couldn't stand it then. And then yes. uh, a couple years later in high school, I heard the uh, How Great Thou Art cover or like that you guys did and it blew my mind at how good it was and that that was kind of my introduction to to you and to your music yeah well that was uh and now i own the album all these years later awesome that's Chris, that's have- what the best the best way to be a fan is to do it after i'm out of the band and it doesn't help me in any way <laughs> I'm that, hoping honestly, that it, <laughs> eventually that's that'll happen with death therapy. Yeah. Every every band I find that I like, I'm like, oh, and they broke up last week. Like, right. There's a time. meme about that. There's a meme about that, right? Like the little old the guy yeah. old guy on his laptop. Oh, and they just broke oh, up. Yeah. Yep. Totally. <laughs> yeah. I do I own a s- physical copy of Voices though, so I have I guess very awesome. sp- Small amount helped you out there. Plus some <laughs> I got all three records on vinyl right behind me. Woo! So, there That's we go. Right. I got a death therapy hoodie in my closet right there. Sweet. And you're not wearing it? No. I... <laughs> Disappointing. Oh, Is it I... weird when, like, if we were to wear death therapy merch, like, just how it's like when bands wear their own merch on stage? Do you ever do that? Hmm. I do weird? not wear I do not wear my own merch on stage because I can't afford to buy my own merch <laughs> <laughs> from myself. Uh, I need to sell every last one of those jokers. I'm not going to sweat in that. Uh, yeah, but yeah, oh, no, I, yeah, I, it doesn't. I don't. We uh we toured with the Showdown a ton when I was in Becoming the Archetype, and they all would rock all their own merch on stage and. I think it's just an attitude thing. It's like it was just it was awesome when they did it. But I think if I do it it just looks desperate. So <laughs> Oh man. It's rough out there. Mm. Um I yeah. I wanted to ask. I, I told myself that I would limit my becoming the archetype questions to maybe one or two because mm-hmm. You're in death therapy now, and that's what right. that's your focus. But I guess a good way to blend the two is: Can you take us through your metal journey? How old were you when you got into metal? What bands got you there? And how did you uh, get into becoming the archetype? And then from there to you had it's Solomors, am I correct? And then death therapy. Mm-hmm. Well, if, okay, so if Wikipedia yeah, Wikipedia is right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's Wikipedia is the bane of my existence. Every time I apply for a job, I feel like they go Google search me and find my Wikipedia and I don't don't get the job. So if anyone out there is hiring and they don't mind the fact that I'm crazy heavy metal guy, but, um, uh, so I, I got into metal as an accident and really I got into music as an accident. Uh, I had a friend who played, who was the original drummer for becoming the archetype. He goes by the name Duck, like Duck as in quack, quack, Duck, Mr. Ducksworth, (laughs) uh, Mighty Ducks, Brent Duckett is his name. And we met when we were like 14, 15 in high school, and he had drum set in his house. 
a classic story of uh, a guy, you know, who went over to his musical friend's house and I didn't know anything about music. And um, my parents like music that's on the radio, but that was about all I'd ever experienced with music. My parents don't play any instruments and um, or anything like that. So uh, eventually Brent got a guitar player that came over and they started playing guitar and then they got a singer. Uh, it wasn't me. And I was just the friend hanging out like while they played songs. And um, and then their singer quit. And I was like, well, I could be your singer. <laughs> and um, so I became, yeah. And they were doing. Did you have any play- prior singing experience before this? Um, other than singing in choir at school, which I only did because it was an easy elective class. Um <laughs> Uh, no, I didn't have any like screaming metal experience, but who does when they're 15 or 16 years old? And we played our very, very first uh, show and the song that they wanted to play. So the song that I learned was a song called Skin Like Winter by Zayo. And we played it at a school talent show and scared the crap out of everyone <laughs> and did not win the talent show. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, to show how old I am. Is there footage of that online? I don't think so. You know, there's some interesting footage from the Becoming the Archetype days, but I don't think that one is online. Are you going to talk find... about the... Uh, I've seen the wedding video when you guys played a wedding. We did play a wedding reception one time. Not a wedding, a wedding reception. Okay. There's a difference. Okay. And we all wore suits. Daniel wore, Daniel wore like a purple suit. It was pretty fun. <laughs> but... uh. But anyway, so I got like thrown in is what I'm trying to say. I got thrown into the fire. Prior to that, I was only listening to like, uh, you know, punk rock, maybe like MXPX and um, POD was like one of the first heavy metal shows. I, heavy metal shows I went to was POD. And uh, Ooh, yeah, nice. so then from there, I started getting into getting into Living Sacrifice, got into Extol, got into, then I got into like dream theater and more techie kinds of bands and went through a phase like that. And, uh, yeah. And then I ended up with becoming the archetype. We did five, four or five, whatever it was albums together. And then toured all over the world, got to go to Africa on one of the last tours that we did, which is super cool. And, um, that was a good story. And then my wife was, we were going to have our first child. So I was like, I'm not making any money here, so I better go make some money somewhere <laughs> and uh, quit becoming the archetype. <laughs> and 2013, I did a project called Solomores, which was just literally some one of the guys who had been in becoming the archetype who lives in Pennsylvania sent me a bunch of songs. and was like, hey, you want to do vocals on these? And so then I basically just like I had all these ideas sort of like pent up, I guess, and I didn't realize it. I was able to like write all the lyrics and come up with the concept and the artwork and everything in like a week. And I was like, okay, cool. And I went and recorded and he was like, okay, only screaming on this record, only screaming. And then I went into the studio because I had never done, I had never done anything other than screaming. So that was a pretty safe bet in his part or on his part. And so then I go into the studio and because there was like no pressure, because this was nobody had ever heard this band before. I was like, well, I should probably do some cool, some singing. So I did all kinds of like singing parts and like weird, like five part harmonies that sounds like Lord of the Rings. And like, it's all kinds of weird stuff on that record. And I only tell you about that one, not because that, I mean, it's a cool record, but because that sort of is the launching point for where I was like, you know, maybe I could do music still. And maybe I could try to branch out and maybe I could have the guts to try to sing a little bit. And here we are, it's 2021. And I just put out my first record with death therapy. That's mostly singing rather than screaming. So it's taken me, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) that whole journey I just described (laughs) uh, to get up the guts to be like, well, what if I don't just go into the microphone? Um, (laughs) You know, what if I actually tried to like sing? I'm not saying, I'm not saying that anybody who screams is not like able to sing. I'm saying for me personally, I mean, some of these guys out there are freaks like Ryan from fit for a King is a, he's a freak, man. He can do it. He can do it all. Like he can scream for an hour and a half and then sing for 
an hour and it's just it all sounds awesome i i've never been that guy i gotta kind of pick my poison but uh yeah Mm -hmm. so now it's 2021 and i've got like a million little projects i'm working on some of them Mm -hmm. are screaming in metal and some of them aren't and we'll see what happens i think that's a perfect segue to plug in your patreon real quick for those who might be interested totally uh for anyone who's still listening who hasn't uh turned it off yes thank you for listening this far <laughs> oh god through all the technical difficulties and we see chris those is, analytics chris is going to be mad at me because i'm talking about technical difficulties and he's going to edit all the difficulties out i might not i mean Maybe not. I, I was just talking to sean about how much time it takes to edit these things sometimes <laughs> i might just leave it all as is. yeah uh but uh yeah so i started i just started a patreon i mean like within the past month started a Patreon because I realized that I needed to get over my fear of trying to like, I always, the reason I didn't do a Patreon before is I was like, I just don't think I'm good enough. And I don't think people want more content from me. (laughs) So I don't have a YouTube channel. So I don't have a, a TikTok, mm-hmm. like I just, I'm just, the, I'm just we the guy. A, that would be a good place to go. <laughs> yeah, Christian comedy uh, with Jason Wisdom. I, I'm TikTok. just, I've just always been the guy. Like this is a little bit behind the curtain. I've just always been the guy who's like, I kind of want to work in the studio until that, till it sounds the way I want it to sound, and then like I'm more of a, um, I'm more of a painter than a performer. I guess is the way. To, I don't know how else you would put mm-hmm. it. Like I. Uh, mm-hmm. I would rather like sit in my dark little closet and work on the piece that I'm working on until it's perfect and then let you hear it. And then, you know, I can go play the concert or whatever. But, um, so I was like, who, who's going to want more stuff from me? I'm not, but, uh, in 2020, I sort of got forced into a corner where I like, I didn't have anything else going on. So I was like, well, what if I just spend my working hours, like nine to five, working on music or writing or whatever. So I wrote two books, a children's book and a devotional book and uh, recorded a couple of things. I've actually got an album that I can't talk about right now, but that I'm working on. I've got a Christmas EP that I just started announcing. Heavy breathing intensifies. <laughs> I, I don't know. You you can allow yourself to believe it's whatever you want it to be, but it's probably not what you think. It, but my point is I, I'm still... <laughs> It's just it's just a full jazz album. <laughs> it's just jazz odyssey part two. But um, but I uh, my point is I've got like a million things I'm working on, and I was like, I realized one day I was like, well, what if I just trust that there are people out there who want to support this and want me to keep doing this rather than go deliver pizzas or whatever else? Um, and so yeah, stepped out and started a Patreon. So far, there's been an awesome group of like 36 people who have joined and I've been trying to post regular stuff there for them behind the scenes stuff, songs that I've never released demo songs, um, you know, all kinds of stuff. And then I'm also going to just basically give people like, if they're a patron, I'm just going to give them the music that I put out because to me, the music is the music is the thing I'm doing. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. No, if anybody awesome. wants to, we'll, if anybody uh... wants to check that out, that was a long, a long pitch for it, but I think it tells you a little bit more about me and what I'm doing. That's why I wanted to give you right. that pitch. Yeah. So for sure. We'll, we'll have all the uh, links in the description at down below on the video and sort of links in the show notes on streaming services that you can try mm-hmm. and find if you can. <laughs> uh, real quick. I wanted to, um, I want to go back to, you were talking about um, your beginning in the scene. So you've been in the scene quite a while. You've, uh, started in what 2004 2005 you kind of got into the christian metal scene right well yeah we we got signed in 2004 basically 1999 is probably when i would say we started the band and got involved in playing shows okay going to cornerstone and being involved in that whole scene that's awesome so i guess i just want to ask like how have you seen the the christian metal scene change in that 20 odd years um just in terms of, uh, I guess, the messages that the bands uh, that the bands write about, the music, uh, how bands 
approach whether or not they're like a Christian band or not? How have you seen um, the Christian metal scene change and evolve? This, I think this question is a trap. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, it's <laughs> uh, no, no. I, I, I think it would be a trap for a lot of people. But actually, you know that this is a, something I don't mind talking about. So I um, exactly <laughs> like we planned it. <laughs> yeah, we rehearsed all this earlier. Um, we didn't. We absolutely didn't. But um, uh, yeah. So in like the early 2000s to mid 2000s, there was definitely a huge wave of like Christian metal core and emo bands, you know, so many uh, legendary bands came out of that, um, came out of that time bands like Norma Jean and under oath and Zayo and, you know, wh whoever you want to name demon hunter and Hesley dying and whomever tons, tons and tons of bands that dominated the scene for, and still are dominating the scene in a lot of ways. Um, and the, I think the reason was because there was like a, almost like a unconscious agreement of, amongst churches around the country that, Hey, we're going to support the young people that want to make music for Christ, even if it's a little bit noisy. And so they opened up their basements and bands like under oath and Norma Jean and living sacrifice and my band and other bands, we, we would, you could almost do a whole U S tour just playing church basements and stuff. And there would be tons and tons of people there. It's crazy. Um, it was just a thing. It was a it was a time. You know, you go to, we'd go to Cornerstone Festival, and there would be bands that literally were like Cornerstone famous. They would like nobody knew who they were, but they would play for like five thousand people at Cornerstone. Um, I mean, there's yeah, it's crazy uh, the way it was back then. And so the the consequence of that is that a lot of bands sort of wore the christian title because it was mm -hmm. beneficial you could you, instead of going and playing a bunch of clubs in your local town and bars and stuff and hoping that people thought you were cool um because there's not that's a hard thing to do with with like like metal has become more accepted now like it's 2021 and slipknot's been around for 20 years and they've been played on the radio now Right. And, and Spotify right. is a thing. It's exposed. It's exposed a lot of people to metal. But in like the early 2000s and even before that, to be like a death metal band with like screaming was even in the secular scene, that was super like niche. Like, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of place for it. But all of a sudden this Christian thing was happening and bands could like jump from zero to warp tour. And they. You know. And they had like no fans in the general market, like in the secular market, but they had like thousands and thousands of fans in the Christian market. And then they carried over. So anyway, fast forward to 2010, 2012, whatever. So now that scene, that scene is like completely gone. <laughs> I don't mean right. that. Like, I don't mean, I don't mean it's completely gone. There are some people who'd be like, no, I still have shows at my church, you know, or whatever. But it became like, <laughs> it became, uh, it became almost like a, it became almost like a stigma. It was like, well, that's where the bands that can't really make it go play. And right. if you're good, if you're, so I'll use Atlanta as an example. It's not that you, anybody will recognize the names of these <laughs> names of these venues or anything. It doesn't matter. But uh, in Atlanta, the Christian tours in the two thousands would come through and they play at a church uh, and the venue was called the greenhouse and all the big ones. I saw POD there. I saw project Day six, Norma Jean, Louis Sacker, saw all those bands there. And then the real bands, quote unquote, would play the masquerade um, or mm -hmm. somewhere like that. And it was like, so it was like a two level, you know, the, the Christian bands wanted to get to the bigger level, even though they were playing for just as many people. Anyway, it became like a stigma. So at this point in time, 2021, I mean, to call yourself a Christian band is pretty much to put yourself in a little box and say, I'm only going to market myself only to Christians. And, uh, I'm really going to hope that skillet takes us on tour. And <laughs> I mean, we're still waiting for the skillet death therapy tour. <laughs> listen, every, every time I, okay. So every time we have played, uh, a festival and skillet has been there. Um, I, I, I think like three or four times I've run into John Cooper from skillet 
And every time I go up to him, I'm like, hey, man, we're playing over here on this other stage because, of course, we're not playing the same stage they're playing. Um, we're playing over here on this little piece of plywood that, that they put out on in the, the field. Main stage. <laughs> yeah, we're playing on the little the little plywood stage over here, and um, <laughs> and and he'll be like, "Oh, what's the name of your band?" I'm like, "Oh, it's called Death Therapy." And I'm telling you, I'm not lying. Every time he goes, "Oh, well, what do you guys sound like?" And I was, he's met me like four or five times, and we've had this same discussion. Every time I say, "Well, some people say we sound like a heavy skillet." And and uh, I can't tell if you guys are laughing or not because I think I'm frozen. But, <laughs> so, but uh, long story short, now the last couple times I've said that he's he's been like, "Oh yeah, you said that last time, didn't you?" And uh, <laughs> now he remembers you. So I'm oh, hoping man. that ev- I'm hoping that eventually he'll be like, "Hey, you know this." This guy who keeps saying he sounds like a heavy skill, maybe he's just go check it out and he'll like it or something. I don't know. But my point show uh, him tension. Uh, yeah, I'll show him that yeah. song. <laughs> oh, there's, gosh, a becoming, there's a becoming the archetype equivalent to that song, by the way, for people who know Becoming the Archetype's catalog. There's a song on the last record I did with Becoming the Archetype called Invisible Creature. No, Cardiac Rebellion. Sorry, it's a two part song. Cardiac Rebellion. And the saxophone player from Five Iron Frenzy, not saxophone, trombone. Oh, wow. The one yeah. that goes like that. The one that goes like yeah. that. He, uh, people listening on the podcast are like, what? Uh, the video, <laughs> is the, the trombone, it goes, it goes, rrr, rrr, uh, the, <laughs> the guy from Five Iron Frenzy, like my all time favorite band, uh, we were able to get him to come do. Uh, trombone solos and stuff and it's it's like as it like as a legit ska part in the song uh, like a dark metal ska part so if you're not aware of that song please go make fun of me and listen to it cardiac rebellion and then go follow it up with tension <laughs> and then wash it down with the video game music that i make for that therapy and <laughs> oh, and your friends your friends will never want <laughs> to ride in the car with you Ever again. But there was a point to what I was saying before I got on John Cooper. Um, The point is, uh, I think that there's become more opportunity for a band that has faith to just jump straight to the general market listeners. And I think that's really cool. I'm not salty about that at all. Um, I kind of have the label all over me because I came from that 2000s thing and because uh, it's, I'm one of the, I don't know if, I don't know, I don't know if I want to say I'm one of the few. I just don't know. Like I haven't, I haven't given up my faith. I haven't become like a, hey, Christianity sucks kind of person on social media like a lot of people mm-hmm. from that time have. Um, I think Christianity is true. So I'm a Christian. I don't do Christianity because I think it's cool. I am a Christian because I think it's true. <laughs> so, it's and I've not. studied it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I, yeah, I've studied, I've studied it a lot. Uh, I went to, I went to seminary and got two worthless master's degrees in uh, stuff. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, just for funsies, I. But yeah, I guess, I guess my point is like. Um, Nowadays, it doesn't benefit a band. So I see lots of arguments online. People are like, is is Slayer a Christian band? Because they have this one song that talks about God and stuff. And like, I'm like, okay, no. <laughs> and you know I'm being facetious, but like, people argue about what bands are Christian bands and what bands aren't. And I'm just like, right. this has got to be this has got to be the the oldest and lamest argument. And if the band doesn't make it really, really clear in 2021, then just they're not a Christian band. It doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean they're not Christian. I mean, like, mm-hmm. I, I'm going to use an example. I'm going to use an example. Probably going to stick my foot in doo doo somewhere with this example. But like, <laughs> but like, uh, is is the Devil Wears Prada a Christian band? I I don't think they no. would. I don't think they would say they are. And I don't mean that to say that they're not Christians. I don't mean that to say that their songs don't have good 
spiritual meanings. I just mean to say I'm pretty sure that they don't want that label. Okay, the end. Like, I just mm-hmm. again, it doesn't mean you can't listen to them. Um, you know, it just means that when I see people on the internet who are like, I guess my thing is, I think it's the book of First Corinthians where Paul talks about like the people who are concerned about eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols. I think it's First Corinthians. I could be mm-hmm. wrong, but uh, you know what I'm talking about. The idea is to me. To me, it's like if you really care about whether or not a band's a Christian, like you're one of those people that only listens to Christian music. If you really care, then why not play it safe? You know, and only listen to bands that are explicitly Christian. Why? Why try to horseshoe like or horseshoe? Try a shoehorn, not horseshoe. <laughs> shoehorn i'm making all kinds of like stupid like hand gestures for the people who are listening on uh podcast <laughs> as i'm tra- like yeah as you try to shoe your horse you try to horn shoehorn bands into the christian category <laughs> who don't want to be there yeah it's true you've seen you you yeah. know what i'm talking about though how many times oh, have yeah. you seen people how many times have you seen people recently be like, my favorite Christian metal band is Wage War? And I'm like, I oh mean, my Wage, God. War, Wage War is awesome. <laughs> they're, si- they're sick. I like Wage War. But like, why? Why are they your favorite Christian band? Because you saw them on tour with August Burns Red? I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so. They're not think, a Christian I band. I, I mean, spend- I don't, I don't, I don't care. I'm yeah, out. like yeah. I think I spend more time these days trying I'm to out. convince people why a band isn't Christian than like being the whole like oh like this is a Christian band like like you were saying it should be if they want that title it should be obvious right because and let me a let it's me not be- popular but like it's not it it should be an honor to have like as a Christian like. Yeah, that actually tries to follow Jesus that, you know, like it's it's an honor to have that title. It's like like you should actually. I don't know, not necessarily like work for it, but there should be something to show for it that you live by that title, whereas so many people just say, oh, I'm a a Christian. I went to church once, but like show by how you live. That takes us back to the mature. That takes us back to the maturity discussion, you know, mm-hmm. which to me is like, imagine. Okay, this is one thing I say to people. Imagine if I came up to you as a twenty-something-year-old guy, and you were an atheist. Um, you're an atheist, and I came up to you as twenty-two years old, and I was like, "Man, I used to be an atheist. I grew up an atheist." But, like, when I was 18, I stopped being an atheist because I think being an atheist is dumb. You'd be like, you'd be like, dude, you were 18. You don't know anything about anything. <laughs> but yet, when, when people do this, when people do the same thing in reverse, they go, well, I grew up a Christian. I know everything about Christianity. And when I was 18, I decided it's dumb. It's like, oh, okay. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, you know everything about Christianity. It's like, <laughs> they're, they're like, 90 something year old dudes like who just live in monasteries who don't know everything about you know so ah, whatever Mm -hmm. no yeah definitely i it's yeah it's something like that you know takes a lifetime to really learn like we'll never even know everything about god like by the time we die yeah i do want to make it clear i'm not trying to say that we should like be picky about what bands we listen to. I'm not trying to say that we should be like, Mm -hmm. these bands are Christian because they drink beer or something. Like I'm not that guy. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) What I'm trying to say is if you are the person who cares, then quit doing this dumb game is all i'm trying to say that's all it's literally all i'm saying i made this comment at one point and it went viral or whatever you want to call it and people were like yeah yeah that's right he is only stripers christian you know or something and, <laughs> and i'm just like 
No, it's not what I'm trying to say at all. I'm just, okay, I quit. You know? <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. It's all good. I lost my train of thought on what I was saying anyway, so. <laughs> hmm. Maybe I should take over this podcast. Maybe. Yeah, you can start asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should start interviewing you. Canadian. This this happens a lot, actually. This does. Yeah, <laughs> Jeremy took over our interview. Meadows took over our interview. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh. That's the way it should be. <laughs> so are you saying we should take over death therapy? No, no, no. <laughs> no, I'm saying you know what I'm saying. I'm saying it's great if, if you if you have a if you're having a good discussion, then everybody is sort of yeah leading, exactly. leading the discussion. Uh, qu- mm-hmm. There's uh, question and answer times with bands can be so so lame sometimes because it can be like it could just be like so I heard that your favorite food is burritos is that true and it's like <laughs> the band guy the band guy's like yeah I like burritos <laughs> <laughs> and that's oh, the interview man. it's that's so awkward it's much better when we can just talk and hang out and yeah. So. Oh yeah, I guess I I want to ask something. If if you answer a hundred percent honestly, it might get you in trouble. So feel free to answer more politically correct. I guess and I or say. if it's really bad, if it's really bad, we can edit it. Yes. <laughs> um, since you've been in the scene um, to see it grow to what it was and to see what it is now and that whole transition. Mm-hmm. I assume you've probably come in contact with a lot of the bands who have fallen away from the faith. I'm not going to mention names. We all know who they are. I don't need a name. Yeah, them. can you tell us all the bands that are <laughs> <laughs> And can you tell us the bands that are fake currently? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got a list. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. No, um, what I want to ask is it, if you're like – that involved in the scene and you've played shows with these guys or you've toured with them. Is it shocking to you? Anytime another band declares they're not a Christian anymore, are you shocked by it? Or are you just like, Oh yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I can totally tell by the way they acted behind stage or just whatever like that. It doesn't shock me uh, because it's not any, it's not really any different than what's happening in the wider demographic of the culture in general i most of the people that i hung out with when i was in my teens and 20s in youth group are not christians anymore um statistically that's the trend so i think with bands it becomes like if i were to say how many if like if i knew somebody who was an entrepreneur and they had a bunch of entrepreneur friends and i said well how many of your entrepreneur buddies have maintained their super, super strong Christian faith. I'm sure the answer is really, really low. And being in a band is, is like being an entrepreneur, but like under a microscope, because you're not just running a business, you're running a business. That's like about your personality and getting people to like your band. You know what I mean? It's like being in the entertain, being in the entertainment world is like, you have to make decisions quickly uh, about that kind of stuff. Do I want to say something that will make these people not like me? <laughs> um, you know, and then some people do, some people are like, Oh, well, I'm just going to pick this. You know, there's whole industries now that are like the whole country and the whole culture is splitting into like, there's like the conservative talking heads. And then there's like the left wing talking heads and like people just pick which ones they want to support. And, uh, so what I'm saying is it doesn't surprise me when I see people pick a side um, and they pick the side that's maybe a little less, I don't know, traditional or Christian or whatever you want to call it, because it's not the popular thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, it doesn't surprise me. Um, it does. It does. It, the thing that surprises me is when I meet someone that we toured with or whatever, and I see that they, you know, they're a strong Christian person. Like um, I saw that Symphony in Peril is apparently doing some stuff. Uh, or, or teasing some stuff and that's mm-hmm. that's cool and like i think sean has remained a pretty strong i think he's a pastor uh yeah like that's that's pretty cool um to me that's surprising um and i don't mean it to say that like all those other people are dumb or they're they're lame or whatever because they i 
everybody's on their own journey, you know, whatever the, the catchphrase is that we got to use, but like to make it sound okay. Our faith but, journey. Yeah. Everybody's on a journey. We're all figuring it out. Um, but I, I mean, I guess, like I said, I'm a Christian because I'm convinced it's true. And so if I wasn't convinced it's true, I probably wouldn't be. So at that point, I wouldn't blame someone who uh, I would just say that the thing that bums me out is when people who never really took their faith seriously sort of rode the wave of success. And then as soon as it became cool to dump Christianity and do the whole deconstruction thing or whatever you want to call it, like, then they were like, oh, yeah, Christianity sucks. You know, it's like, oh, well, I knew you 15 years ago and that you didn't want to be considered a Christian or a Christian band, but you just did it to get paychecks. Like, that was one of the controversies with Tim Lambesis, you know, his whole, when he went to prison, I think he gave an interview to somebody saying that like 80% of the bands that say they're Christians aren't. And a bunch of people were like, whoa, is that true? And I'm like, I don't know if it's 80%, but I mean, wh that's, why would he make that up? Like, mm -hmm. he's just telling you from his own experience, like, you know, back in the day, that was, you know, most of the records got sold at the Christian bookstores, you know, so, mm -hmm. which apparently are still a thing in Canada. But, you guys, you guys but, still have block, Blockbuster? No, uh, we actually, we that that got removed and replaced by a place called at least the one across the road from me here that used to be a blockbuster it's now bulk barn which is where you go buy like bulk candies and nuts and stuff <laughs> it's so weird seeing that but Bul bulk, the bulk barn <laughs> bulk are you sure that are you sure that's are you, not, sure. Are you sure that's not like a local gym that's like a local bulk gym barn. the bulk barn no um Let's go to the bulk like barn, the eh? Bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the Christian bookstore thing, though. We don't really sell much music except for like the top like worship albums that are coming out or Christmas CDs. Now that it's November, they just right. put out all the Christmas stuff. <laughs> but yeah. there's a we had a hard rock section. I think in the last two years that I worked, I worked there just over two years. I probably actually convinced somebody, like, sold maybe five albums from our rock section. <laughs> you know, the, the Become and the And it was Arch hard, man. <laughs> the Become the Archetype records, uh, I can remember, had to have had to have stickers on them for yeah. alterna alternate Thank covers. Thank you for buying Christian music. <laughs> No, that's they still have some of those stickers on them. It was like it was it was it covered up the scary image of the angels fighting the demons or the <laughs> severed head or whatever. Demon Hunter had those too. I can remember back in the day because it has a skull with the yeah spooky yeah. Demon Hunter. They're just they're so scary, so scary. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to ask. Um, you've probably been judged quite a bit in the. Uh, in just the whole Christian scene. I mean, you're from the South. You probably have a lot of older folks who don't understand metal judge you. Mm. Do you have like just a hilarious story of like the worst argument someone has ever made for why like metal is scary or why metal can't honor or glorify God? No, I mean, I agree with all those things you just said. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, no, uh, I can remember one time this was when becoming the archetype was not called, we were called something else. And we, uh, we were just getting started and we did a, one of our first tours in like 1999 ish. We drove all the way up to Virginia somewhere. I think we might've even driven to uh, some reason in my mind, it's Pennsylvania. We played some shows in Pennsylvania. We drove or in Virginia, we drove to Pennsylvania to play a show in a church parking lot. And we started to play. And the pastor came running out of the building and started screaming, no, 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 not this. No, no, not here. No. And turned off the PA system and we, we drove home. So <laughs> it's, uh, you know, and you can have those arguments. Well, look at the lyrics, man. And like, you're not gonna, you're not gonna persuade anybody with that. I mean, uh, 
I've told people. I persuaded my grandma back in the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, but it's probably rare. not. Probably not if you actually forced her to listen to it regularly. Um, I don't know. Maybe you did. Maybe grandma was super into it. My, I showed my grandma. Uh, we we went on a walk. Like our family went on a walk, and I had earbuds, and she was like, "Oh, what are you listening to?" And I'm like, "I, I don't know if I want to show you this." <laughs> I'm like, "You might not like it." And then, but it was a uh, breaker by four today, that whole album. We listened to the whole album and she's like, I can understand what he's saying. This is really good. Hey, there you go. <laughs> no way. Well, <laughs> yeah. Grandma is grandma. She for, listen to it right there. Grandma for the win. Right. Um, well, <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is so, so oddly enough, oddly enough, this is my story. Cause you asked for a cool story and this is, this is not necessarily funny, mm-hmm. but. I mentioned that we recorded with Devin Townsend uh, in in Gibson's BC. And Devin's not a Christian. He uh, traditionally was known for being pretty much the opposite, like, of a Christian. Just sex and drugs and rock and roll and to the max. Like, that was his thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Chaos was his life. Um, When we met him, he... uh, he had more or less recently stopped all of that. He basically had stopped playing in his, his band strapping young lad, which is like a crazy chaotic metal band. And he stopped drinking and he had stopped doing drugs and cut off his long, crazy dreadlocks that he had. And so then we show up this Christian man from the Bible belt. And he was very, he was very concerned. He was like, I, Not concerned that we were dumb or we were lame or we were like, he was concerned. Get this. He was concerned because he didn't understand. Uh, My video cut out for a second. That was weird. Oh, it's all good. (laughs) Uh, He was concerned that we were making spiritually angry sounding music with Christian lyrics. And he didn't understand how that those two things could go together. Wow. And I'm telling you, he, and so he's very like into like new agey stuff. So he was, he was basically like, well, it's like, got, it's got this like angry energy, but then you're trying to say it's got these like positive Christian lyrics. I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me. And we had a lot of talks about that kind of stuff. And uh, at the end of the day, I, I've, I've kind of come to understand I could be, exaggerating this a little bit but i'm pretty sure that i've got this directly from folks around him and from things i've heard him say he came to sort of a position where he he makes heavy music again now and he has for like 10 years um after that and he it's if you listen to it it's much more positive mm-hmm. the lyrics are more positive the it's not christian uh, but it's much more like uplifting sounding. It's much more hopeful. It's probably Christian to some people. <laughs> well, yeah, probably Christian. Ah, I don't know. He, mentioned- <laughs> he, he talked about God in one of the songs. <laughs> yeah. Well, but yeah, he has a song called Genesis on his new record. Is really, really good. Um, That's a book of the Bible. <laughs> I, Devin, I love Devin. He's so cool. But my point is, what did I take? Away, what do I take away from that? Here's what I take away from that. I think Devin was slightly mistaken and he realized that, but I think he's also slightly correct. And that is to say that heavy metal music or any extreme art form has the potential to sort of push people to a dangerous place mentally or psychologically or whatever. Um, and I know there's been all kinds of studies that show that heavy music actually calms people down. And, and it does. It does. Like, I'm not trying to say that, like, if you listen to heavy music, you're a bad person. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, it's true, but that's not what I'm saying. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, what I'm trying to say is that there probably are some people who, like, to them, metal is just like, it's too extreme. It's too crazy. And. I'm not trying to convince them to be okay with it. Like, I don't, if it's not for them, it's not for them is what I'm trying to say. You know, Um, I don't listen to what they listen to probably. But uh, I guess what I'm saying is Mm -hmm. I don't think everybody, 
I, I, I don't think everybody's grandma has to listen to for today. <laughs> if that makes sense. It's okay if grandmas think for today yeah, is weird because sure. I'm going to think probably whatever my kids are listening to in 30 years, I'm going to think is super weird. So probably. <laughs> Dude, yeah. the stuff the kids are listening to these days. Oh. Oof. Did you lose my video again? Because I lost Christopher's video again, which makes me think that he lost I lost mine. Chris and Jason. <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Chris. Okay. I yeah, can't no, hear it's, Chris, no. It's... Oh, no? you can't? I cannot, but that's actually oh, better. you're back. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, he can hear I, you. <laughs> I can see him too. Listen, listen. I'm look. I, I, if I'm talking over you, Chris, I'm sorry, but that's par for the course. Everybody who's heard this has realized I talk over you. Um, but uh, <laughs> I'm I. I really hope your editing skills are awesome because this is this has been wild, man. This is a wild ride. I don't have you, but it's okay, buddy. Dang it! What? Sorry, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, he's dying right now. Why? Okay. Why can't well, it come back? Uh, that's pro- <laughs> we probably should wrap it up, I guess. Yes, we are going to wrap it up. Um, that's a, I guess, Sean, if you want to do the wrap up, yes, I can't talk I can do the, I guess I got to do the wrap up. <laughs> uh, but I want to say goodbye to him. Uh, but yes. then we'll we'll pause it. We'll stop Chris it. Chris said we'll he wants to say up. goodbye to you. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, that's, re- that's really sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I... I I can't see you and I can't hear you. And my video says it's seventy percent uploaded. I don't know if that's a bad oh, sign. Yikes! Uh, it's, yeah, it's fine. It's it'll upload. Sign, don't but worry. It'll. But that's um, why we have to I was, stop I was it. Gonna, I'm going to turn the internet off as soon as it's over. No, I know. I'm trying to tell you to do. <laughs> Chris is talking to talking as if you can hear him. <laughs> I got nothing, buddy. Oh man! If the, if this all makes it into this, oh, it's going to be hilarious. I don't know that it's as funny for other people as you think it is. Uh, probably I think, not. <laughs> I think we're laughing. Be- All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on, Jason. It's been an awesome conversation. We appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. <laughs> we lost you, Jason. <laughs> no, I have him still. I. You still have Jason? I said thank you for having me. <laughs> okay. I and I even that. heard it echo. I heard it on Christopher's side. I heard myself say thank you. Okay, I, I hear you now. I just lost your video. I'm gonna say a I'm gonna say a bad word. <laughs> All right, Chris, you do it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jason. It was a pleasure and honor to have you on our show and to meet you. Um, so thank you so much for spending your time tonight. Oh my goodness, I cannot talk like this. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Here we go. Jason, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your time on the podcast. You've been a great guest. Kingdom Core X, Kingdom Core X for life. Cut. That's it. That, that, that's the ending. All right. Well, I hope you guys had as many laughs as we did. That was an insanely hilarious and also frustrating episode to make with all those little technical hiccups throughout. Uh, We just want to give a special thank you to our core givers on Patreon. Jonathan Lyman had to try and get that one right this time. Hopefully I did, buddy. Uh, As well as my brother Peter from Christian Metal Source. Thank you guys for being our core givers of $10 or more a month. All your guys' help is so appreciated in what you guys do for the podcast. All right, stay tuned. We will be back for some more at some point soon. See you then.